All right, I think the time is now. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the seminar speaker today, Daniel Trevelyan, who will be sharing his master's research that he did in my lab. So Daniel received his undergrad degree in 2014 from Oregon State University, and he's had an impressive track record of ecological research prior to starting graduate school. So Daniel worked for the USGS, Arizona Game and Fish Department, Idaho Power Company, and the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. So these positions had him working on everything from anadromous fish to aquatic invertebrates, amphibians, large mammals, and birds. Um, so Daniel began graduate school with diverse field experience and ecological knowledge, which has served him well since then. And just recently, he actually landed a job with the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as a biologist working on salmonid and amphibian conservation. So he's tuning in from somewhere in Washington State at the moment. So I'm, I'm happy that Daniel's already uh, gainfully employed, which is fantastic, even before finishing his degree. So Daniel began his MS degree in uh, 2020, shortly before the COVID, COVID pandemic really set in. So he completed virtually his entire degree um, while navigating all the challenges of the pandemic, including a, collecting a huge amount of data by himself or relying on friends and family members to help him <laughs> Uh, survey ponds, including his his mother, who surveyed a number of ponds. So I thought that was pretty neat that she got out there and helped him. So I would describe Daniel as uh, highly self-motivated, independent, and passionate about freshwater ecology and conservation. Um, I've had many enjoyable conversations with him about the ecological patterns he has observed in the field, and he would often come back from field work uh, energized about something new he had observed. So he's also been a highly collaborative member uh, of the research team and very generous with his time and mentoring more junior students. Overall, he's been a really great guy to have around. So I'm fortunate to have worked with him. So Daniel's research focuses on understanding drivers of freshwater pond community structure in the Madison, Wisconsin area. Um, and he found some interesting patterns regarding how communities can shift in response to urbanization. And I think he's done a really nice job of merging some applied ecological questions with, with ecological theory. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Daniel, and, and thank you all for tuning in to listen to his talk. Thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so yeah, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, my name is Dan Trevelyan, and I'm a master's student co-advised by Dr. Dan Preston and Emily Stanley. And today I'm really excited to uh, share with you my graduate research on the influence of urbanization on aquatic community structure in ponds and wetlands. And I wanted to start by talking about why I wanted to study this topic. And so before returning to grad school, as Dan mentioned, I worked in a wide variety of systems with a wide variety of species, everything from marine zooplankton to endangered amphibians to African buffalo to golden eagles. And what I learned in studying all these different organisms is that A, they're all fascinating. And rather than honing in and specializing in one taxa and say becoming like a fisheries biologist or entomologist, I'm much more excited about the system as a whole and all the different components that come together to make it function. And then another uh, common thread through all these varied research projects has been that oftentimes when we build something in an attempt to make our lives easier, whether that's a, a dam or a road or power lines, there are often unforeseen consequences for wildlife or their habitats. And this has led me to become interested in applied research that addresses how we can build infrastructure that meets human needs without sacrificing ecosystem function or biodiversity. And so that brings us to freshwater biodiversity. And among ecosystems, freshwater systems are experiencing declines in biodiversity far greater than those in terrestrial systems. And freshwater is arguably one of the most important natural resources on the planet. And as such, freshwater habitats face intense anthropogenic pressure. And in their landmark paper, David Dungeon and colleagues identified five major threats to freshwater biodiversity. And that was the destruction and degradation of the habitat, overall exploitation of the water as well as species, uh, water pollution, flow modification, and invasion by exotic species. And since they wrote that paper over 15 years ago, these threats have increased and multiplied with additional emerging threats such as climate change, infectious diseases, and harmful algal blooms also becoming major concerns for freshwater biodiversity. And among freshwater habitats, wetlands and ponds are particularly known for supporting high levels of freshwater biodiversity. And I've grouped wetlands and ponds together because ponds are frequently surrounded by wetland habitats and wetlands often have deeper pond regions within them. And both provide some pretty important ecosystem service, services. And those include flood water management, 
nutrient cycling and retention, carbon sequestration, uh, and they can act as stepping stones for aquatic connectivity by being the seasonal flooded habitat. And they also provide some recreational and educational value where people use them for birding, duck hunting, uh, swimming, uh, and angling. But despite their importance, wetland loss is occurring at three times the rate of forest loss. And one of the primary reasons is the nature of their inundated, inundated soils make them difficult to grow or build anything on. So wetlands are often frequently lost or drastically altered in areas targeted for development. <clears throat> and so that brings us to urbanization. And urbanization refers to the concentration of human populations into the discrete areas. And for several decades, there's been this global shift from rural communities to cities, and this trend is projected to increase into the future. And this concentration leads to increased urban development in which the land is transformed for residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation purposes. And this includes not only the densely populated centers, but their adjacent suburban fringes as well. And on a global scale, urbanization affects relatively little land cover, but has a significant ecological footprint. So even small amounts of urban development can have large effects on ecosystems, such as the loss of the natural habitats as they're replaced by uh, urban development, and then uh, in increased habitat fragmentation where the natural habitats remaining are increasingly isolated. Uh, you get increases in temperature with more impervious surfaces, and then you also get concentrated anthropogenic pollutants, and that can be everything from industrial air pollution to lawn fertilizers, to physical trash, to noise and light pollution. And so urban habitats are simultaneously affected by multiple co-occurring and interacting stressors. And these stressors frequently lead to localized species extinctions. However, higher concentrations of humans also lead to increases in accidental and intentional introduced exotic species, which in turn together, they can alter the composition of urban communities in what has been termed biotic homogenization. So homogenization uh, just means the process of becoming more similar. And to understand biotic homogenization, I'm briefly going to review some of the different ways we can measure biodiversity. So first, at the broader scale, if you were to count up all of the different species in a region, which could be a county or a mountain range or a watershed, that would be the gamma diversity. So that's the region-wide diversity. And that gamma diversity would be made up of a variety of species, including some specialist species, which are those that have specific habitat or dietary requirement. Example would be like monarch butterflies that need milkweed. Uh, you'd also have generalist species, which are those that eat a variety of foods and thrive in a wider range of habitats, such as maybe mallards or raccoons. And then you would also have those introduced species, which are those not naturally occurring in an area and arrive through human activities. Example would be like English ivy or European house sparrows. And within that region, if you were to sample a specific area or site and then count up all the different species there, that would be the alpha diversity often measured as species richness. And then if you were to sample several sites and then compare the difference in composition of the species from one site to another, that would be the beta diversity. So beta diversity is just a difference in the uh, composition of species from one site to another. And so the idea behind this theory of urban biotic homogenization is that in urban areas, you tend to lose those specialist species that require specific habitats and you get more generalist species that are more adaptable and as mentioned previously, you get more of those uh, non-native species introductions. And so if you were to sample a bunch of sites and compare the composition of the communities or beta diversity, those that are in urban environments are likely to be more similar in composition or more homogenous. And this theory of biotic homogenization has been well studied in terrestrial systems with studies confirming this theory with birds and mammals and insects. However, there is some nuance with other studies showing this relationship does not hold up with things like terrestrial plants because we've introduced so many different types of ornamental plants for landscaping that urban areas tend to have higher beta diversity than the surrounding natural areas. However, the vast majority of these studies of homogenization tend just to evaluate one taxonomic group such as birds rather than the community as a whole. And most have been in terrestrial systems with very few studies looking at aquatic communities. And so given what we know about the freshwater biodiversity crisis, loss of wetlands and ponds, the impacts of urbanization and the effects they can have on community composition, that led us to ask two main research questions. The first is, how does urbanization influence a wetland or pond's ability to support biodiversity? And then the second is, does urbanization alter community composition and lead to homogenization? So to study how urbanization influences aquatic communities, we chose to conduct our study near the urban center of Madison, Wisconsin. And we chose this area because there are numerous ponds and wetlands in and around Madison 
and Madison is currently the fastest growing city in Wisconsin, Wisconsin and undergoing rapid urban development. And so to begin, I wanted to know what the area looked like before it was developed. So Madison is in the Yahara watershed and both lie within Ho-Chunk land. And although native peoples have lived in the area for thousands of years and undoubtedly had an influence on the landscape, it isn't until the arrival of Europeans in the early 1800s that the landscape begins to be heavily developed and the process of urbanization begins. And so on the left, this is the earliest map I could find of our study site drawn in 1836. And although it's just a black and white drawing, you can see the surveyor took the time to draw the numerous drainages and wetlands surrounding the lakes and noted that the Madison town site was surrounded by extensive forested swamplands. And then on the right, uh, here's a recent aerial image of the Yahara watershed, which shows Madison on the isthmus between Lake Mendota and Monona, with urban development spreading out to several surrounding suburbs, such as Middleton, Verona, and Sun Prairie, and then rural agricultural lands beyond that. And so after 200 years of development, what has happened to all those forested wetlands? Well, as an area becomes more urbanized, more often than not, they are drained, channelized, or developed into stormwater ponds. And these ponds are designed and constructed to retain uh, water after storm events and filter pollutants that flush off the urban landscape before entering the watershed. And there's been a growing interest within the research community about the relationship between the watershed and the stormwater infrastructure and the ability of these ponds to fulfill the same ecosystem service roles as the historic wetlands including their ability to support biodiversity, which has led us to this study. And Madison is really the perfect place to do the study because the way these wetlands and ponds have been developed is highly variable. So some ponds are in industrial areas, some are in the middle of neighborhoods, some border parking lots, and we group these types of ponds and classify them as urban ponds. While other ponds in the urban environment were located in manicured urban parks, as well as urban conservation and natural areas, such as the Arboretum, and so we classify these as green space ponds. So they're urban ponds, but within green spaces. And then as reference sites, we select the ponds outside the urban environment, typically in rural county parks or DNR wildlife areas, which we classified as rural ponds. So here's a map of our study site with all of our pond sites um, and their colors represent the different pond types. We surveyed a total of 70 sites and we randomly selected these based on trying to get an even distribution across the landscape and the, our land uses. Uh, we selected for size. We didn't want any ponds that were so large that were bordering on small lakes. And we wanted to be able to circumnavigate them in roughly an hour. And then we also wanted to control for hydro period and didn't want any ponds that dried over the summer. And so each of these pond sites had a visit in early uh, summer in either May or June, and then a second visit in late summer, either July or August. So two visits per year. And then over the course of two years for a total of four surveys per site and a total of 280 site visits. So this project was spearheaded by the whole Preston lab and it was led by a postdoc, Dr. Aaron Saar, who is researching amphibian use of these urban ponds. The lab collected a variety of data, including zooplankton toes, macroinvertebrate sweeps, fish seines and net sweeps, herp visual encounter surveys and net sweeps, a variety of habitat variables and water chemistry. And then in 2020, I came on to the project to research the community as a whole and resurveyed the sites and added some additional variables I thought might be important, including plant community and composition, pH, depth, woody debris, substrate, and habitat complexity. And so to give you a better idea of my methods uh, for the plant community's composition, I use this UK pond survey protocol in which you circumnavigate the pond and map the vegetation by the percent emergent, floating, and submergent vegetation, as well as the percent open water and substrate. And I did this rather than doing like transects and plots because due to the pandemic, I had to do these surveys by myself and this was just more feasible. And then within each of those uh, plant categories, I would identify all the plants um, and then give those percentages as well. And only the plants within the wetted width of the pond were counted. So I didn't go up into uh, the adjacent dry land habitat. And then for habitat complexity, um, habitat complexity can be measured in a variety of ways, but this is a scoring system that I came up with that I thought captured the variability I was seeing in the ponds. So using those open water emergent and floating plant percentages, I assigned a score from one to five, in which the surface, if the surface was 100% open water or 100% vegetation like duckweed, uh, that was a low heterogeneity score of one. And then if it was an even mix of vegetation to open water, a 50-50 mix, that was a higher heterogeneity score of five. Similarly, I did the same for the benthic, where it was bare substrate to uh, submergent vegetation. And then we also looked at the variation in substrate, so how many different substrates I encountered uh, in the pond. And then we also scored woody debris uh, zero to five, zero having no woody debris and five having woody debris throughout the pond. 
so I took the sum of these scores, divided four, and that's how I got an average habitat complexity score. For the macroinvertebrates, um, we did eight sweeps per site times the 70 sites. So we had 560 macroinvertebrates uh, that we identified. And so this is what I did for the vast majority of the pandemic. Uh, I had hundreds and hundreds of insect samples at my house and I was going through them, identifying them. And I was very fortunate to have an awesome team of undergraduates that uh, were looking to do independent research projects. And so I would give them a subset of sites to compare. They would uh, help me sort all these insect samples and I'd identify them to family, give them the data. And uh, throughout this process, we completed 15 undergraduate independent research projects. And this was really rewarding for me because as an undergraduate, I also worked in an aquatic entomology lab sorting insect samples. And so to mentor these students and pass on that uh, knowledge was, was really an awesome experience. And then for the aquatic vertebrates, uh, I'd start by doing a five minute binocular survey in which before I disturbed the site from a distance, I surveyed uh, for any species like turtles basking or frogs or amphibians on, on the side before they were disturbed and maybe dived were harder to see. And then I'd circumnavigate the pond and do a visual encounter survey noting any species I found. I'd do an e eight, eight evenly spaced dip net sweeps per site. And then we did three seine net hauls and so any vertebrates that were encountered, uh, any life stage, if they were a tadpole or adult, um, that was kind of pres present at the pond. And in total, we found 24 aquatic vertebrate species. And so to sum up the taxonomic data, we found three turtle species, nine amphibian species, 12 fish species, 52 macroinvertebrate families, and 68 plant taxa. And I say taxa because although most were identified as species, some of the emergent vegetation we were left was left at the genus level. And then the zooplankton toes we wanted to include but due to uh, the limitations of a master's and just the time, we weren't able to get those done and another student will uh, complete that part of the project. So with this data to start, we wanted to look at some of the general patterns of richness. So we preferred, performed an analysis of variance to compare the richness of each of our pond types. And as you can see for each of our taxonomic groups, plants, macroinvertebrates, vertebrates, as well as total richness, there's a similar pattern in which on average rural ponds seen here in yellow had more richness uh, than uh, urban ponds, which are seen in this kind of peach color and green space ponds falling in between. And so this was statistically significant for all but plant richness. So now given this pattern of this rural to urban decrease in richness, we return to our first re research question. And that is how does urbanization influence a pond's ability to support biodiversity? And we hypothesize that there'd be factors at both the landscape level as well as the local level associated with urbanization that would influence aquatic diversity. At the landscape level, we believe fragmentation and connectivity would be a major factors uh, influencing community structure. And then at the local level, we believe that habitat quality would be one of the major issues driving community structure. So start with landscape. Uh, at the landscape level, we expected the proportion of developed land cover to negatively influence richness and diversity due to reduced connectivity and increased pollutants from runoff. <laughs> Can you, can you mute, mute that please, sorry. And then uh, similarly, the percent lawn land cover, um, we also believed uh, would reduce taxonomic richness due to being replaced by native vegetation with mowed grass. And then you also lose, you lose plant diversity as well as uh, habitat niches and cover for dispersing animals. And also, as you might also get direct mortality from mowing itself. Conversely, we believe that the greater wetland cover would increase taxonomic richness because wetlands have higher diversity of plants, as well as acting as a seasonal flooded habitat would facilitate connectivity. And finally, uh, we thought the greater distances between ponds and another water body would decrease taxonomic richness due to decreased colonization opportunities. And then at the local level, we believe that urbanization would influence water chemistry and that pH and chloride concentrations would be important with uh, from urban runoff and road salt application. Road salts are a major concern for northern cities like Madison that see a lot of snow and a lot of salt entering waterways from the urban environment. Similarly, many organisms are sensitive to fluctuations of pH and we thought that increase in pH would reduce in, uh, richness in the ponds. And then we also believe that ponds with greater habitat complexity and area would, be, uh, would have greater richness due to increased um, niche space and microhabitat availability. And then finally, we believe that the presence of non-native fish would reduce species richness in ponds due to direct predation and habitat alteration. And in our system, the invasive fish species were carp and goldfish, which have been shown to uh, not only be direct predators of many organisms, 
but also due to their feeding methods, they tend to eat a lot of the plants or uh, uproot plants and cause a really high turbidity in the pond systems. And then it could be possible that it's a mix of both landscape and local, some combination of there that are driving these patterns in richness. So to analyze the relationship between our hypothesized predictor variables and our response variable of total taxonomic richness, we used a generalized linear mix effects model. And we be began by standardizing our variables because they were on different scales. And then we used AICC scores to compare uh, a model with just the landscape variables, a model with just the local variables, or a model that had both local and landscape, uh, landscape variables. And we found that uh, based on these AICC scores that the local and landscape model was the best fit for our data. And to visualize the results, I have this coefficient plot that shows each of our variables and their associated confidence intervals in the red lines. And in this plot, if the confidence interval overlaps with zero, there's not a significant relationship. But if it's to the right of zero, it has a positive relationship with richness. And if it's to the left, it has a negative relationship with richness. So we see here that um, percent development, percent mowed grass, uh, greater distances to nearest water body and invasive fish had a negative relationship. And um, habitat complexity was the only variable with a positive relationship. And so uh, for our landscape variables, we found support for a hypothesis that a uh, greater percent developed and long land cover would, would reduce taxonomic richness and greater distances between water bodies would reduce richness. And for the local variables, we found support for a hypothesis that greater habitat complexity would have a positive relationship with total richness and the presence of invasive goldfish and carp would have a negative relationship with total richness. Interestingly, and somewhat surprisingly, we did not find a significant relationship between either of our water chemistry variables, pH and chloride, or pond area. And so this answers our first question about what factors drive patterns of richness in the ponds. But the question still remains, which taxa make up that richness and does the community change with urbanization to become more homogenous? And so our hypothesis here was that urban ponds, similar to uh, terrestrial plants, would exhibit greater beta diversity and be less homogenous relative to non-urban ponds due to greater heterogeneity in urban pond habitats and differences in invasion status. And to evaluate this, we use a combination of non-metric multidimensional scaling, beta diversity to similarity analysis, which accords for presence absence data, and indicator species analysis. And so to begin, um, we can use an ord ordination technique called non-metric multidimensional scaling to visualize the difference in pond community composition. And in this figure, each point represents a pond community with the color and shape signifying each of the pond types and the size of the point representing the richness of the pond. And these axes are arbitrary, but the pond communities that are more similar to each other are ordinated closest together. So you can see here, the rural ponds are kind of clumped together. They're the more species rich ponds. Um, and then in the peach color, you see that the urban ponds tend to be a little bit more variable in composition and less species rich. Um, and so, um, so they tend to be a little bit more variable. And then using that also with that NMDS, um, you can plot the variables and see which are more associated with the pond community types. And so <clears throat> uh, these more species rich rural ponds were more associated with higher habitat complexity and percent wetlands. And conversely, uh, the more urban ponds were <laughs> associated with higher percent developed and mowed grass land cover, greater distances to nearest water body, invasive fish presence, higher pH and greater area. And so this gives us a better idea of how the different communities, uh, how they vary from pond to pond and what may be driving those communities. But we still wanted to know, how do they compare in beta diversity and are they more homogenous? And so we return to this urbanization figure and in a beta diversity dissimilarity analysis, a score of zero means it's the exact same composition, a score of one is totally different. And for our pond groups, um, what we saw was that they actually have pretty similar beta diversity scores. And we did not find evidence for our hypothesis that urban would be um, higher beta diversity. Even though the scores are in urban and green space were a little bit higher, uh, it wasn't statistically significant. But conversely, we also didn't see any evidence of urbanization and homogenization. If urban sites were becoming more homogenous, you think that beta diversity score would be much lower but they all together are fairly similar. And so now that we looked at the patterns of composition and beta diversity, we still wanted to know which species may change with urbanization and uh, who specifically might be lost in that decrease in richness. To do that, we used NMDS and that species indicator analysis. 
And we found that uh, there are certain species more indicative of rural communities, and that would be things like small fish, like mud minnow and stickleback, uh, vivians like northern leopard frogs and pickerel frogs, uh, blandings turtles, stoneworts, and large predatory insects such as water scorpions and bellostomatids. And for some of these, like the mud minnow, blandings turtles, and stoneworts, they were only found at our rural sites um, and not found anywhere in the urban environment. And conversely, uh, our urban communities were more associated with uh, game fish like bluegill and pumpkin seed, uh, more invasive fish species like goldfish, Chinese mystery snails, and milfoil, and then um, more general species and maybe uh, species tolerant of fish presence like bullfrogs and back swimmers. So although we didn't find evidence for homogenization, we do see a shift in community composition uh, from the rural to urban communities. And interestingly, uh, the green space ponds would have both some of these species uh, that were found in rural sites and not in urban sites, such as stickleback and leopard frogs, but they also had some species that were in urban communities and not found in our rural ponds, such as goldfish and Chinese mystery snails. And so to sum this up, how does urbanization influence ponds and their communities? From question one, we saw that uh, urban ponds tend to have decreases in vertebrate richness, decreases in vertebrate richness, decreases in total richness, but no statistical difference in plant richness. We also saw that greater developed land lawn, lawn and developed land cover uh, reduced richness, greater distances between water bodies reduced richness, and the presence of invasive fish species reduced richness. We saw uh, that greater habitat complexity actually increased richness. And then from question two, we didn't see any strong evidence for homogenization, but saw that there was a shift in urban communities for more game fish and more invasive species and fewer of these rare and specialist taxa. And so summarizing all this, I'm not here to bash urban ponds because urban ponds can support biodiversity. And in fact, although the three highest rich ponds were all rural ponds, our fourth and fifth most species rich ponds were actually urban ponds. So given the right conditions, urban ponds can support biodiverse communities. So what does this all mean? So we have some implications here for management. The first being that green spaces are beneficial to maintaining diversity in urban ponds and wetlands. And so, that's likely because a lot of these green spaces, you tend to get um, less developed land cover and more natural vegetation rather than mowed lawns. And a lot of these um, green space ponds were in these complexes of multiple ponds, so they had greater connectivity and more habitat availability. And so as urbanization expands into the future, uh, the more you can incorporate natural wetlands and ponds or stormwater infrastructure into a green space, uh, the more beneficial it would be to maintaining biodiversity. And a good example of this in Madison was at the Edna Taylor Conservation Park, which is in the urban environment, but had a variety of ponds that all looked pretty different from each other and actually had pretty different communities. And then of course there's trails throughout the ponds uh, where people would go there birding. I saw students there uh, looking at pond communities and kids. Um, so not only is it beneficial for the aquatic community, but I think there can be beneficial for the uh, community as a whole. A uh, second implication would be that retaining a riparian buffer and littoral habitat is important to maintaining diversity. So when you keep trees around these ponds, uh, you tend to get these leaf litter and woody debris inputs that increase habitat complexity. And then rather than having a uh, steep bank in the pond with mowed grass right up to the water's edge, if you have a more shallow slope, it allows for emergent vegetation and this littoral habitat, which is really valuable for uh, larval fish and amphibians and insects like dragonflies. And so um, trying to design ponds with this littoral habitat in mind can be beneficial to maintaining biodiversity. And then last, uh, it's important to educate the public about the risk of introducing non-native species. And I know Wisconsin DNR has been really good about uh, putting out signs and educating the public about the risk of uh, New Zealand mud snails and um, things like uh, zebra mussels. But beyond that, having articles like this one, which is about goldfish in Minnesota lakes, that inform the public at large, and then uh, maybe actually having signs like this at some of these conservation areas in the urban uh, environment, or even potentially in the pet stores that sell these species um, that could be have the potential to become invasive, would be beneficial so that people really know not to release pets into uh, the environment. Um, because once they're there, they're really hard to uh, get rid of, so you want to prevent them from becoming established. And so with that, we have some next steps and future directions. And so for me personally, the next steps are, uh, I've written a manuscript of all this uh, research and it's ready for publication, which I will submit so it's available to the wider scientific community. Um, I've also conducted a side mesocarnivore study 
that was inspired by um, difference of turtle occupancy. Um, and so we looked at a subset of ponds and put camera traps and evaluated the diversity of mesocarnivores as well how, how frequently they visited pond sites. And then um, I put a dummy nest there and see how quickly a dummy nest was predated by a mesocarnivore. So I'm gonna collect all this data and then I'm gonna share that data with uh, all the people that own these ponds and manage them, the city of Madison, Dane County Parks, Wisconsin DNR. And then I'm also gonna share it with the Center for Limnology so that I can pass on all this data for future research. And with that, I have a couple future directions in mind. One uh, is how does water quality relate to uh, these biodiversity patterns? And while we were out there, we did collect water quality samples, but due to the pandemic, the water quality analysis lab was uh, limited to one person in the lab at the time and kind of got backed up. So we didn't actually get those water quality uh, samples analyzed in time, but I think uh, some, some of those samplings would be really informative to look at like how phosphorus or heavy metals might influence biodiversity. The other major thing was pond management. Um, so these ponds can be managed in a variety of ways. And so I saw some are mowed, but others have like controlled burns around the pond. And then kind of things like the frequency of how often they're dredged, that could be really informative um, for managers to see how they're managing the ponds and how that relates to biodiversity. And then also, um, I think it'd be really interesting to incorporate some of the folks on the civil engineering side and look at the different pond designs and how they design stormwater ponds and how that uh, relates to their ability to support biodiversity. And so I think these would be all great future directions where you can apply this uh, biodiversity data to these different applications. And then more than anything, I hope my research and photographs have convinced you that urban ponds and the urban environment in general are more than just a place for lawn clippings and cigarette butts to wash away to. But rather, in spite of us, there's a whole world of fascinating creatures and metamorphoses and species interactions going on, likely within walking distance from your house if you take the time to look. And the human population, as it continues to grow and development continues to expand, which we know it will, we have the opportunity right now to learn from past mistakes and design a better urban environment that sustains ecosystem function and retains native biodiversity. And that can really make the difference between having what has been termed an urban desert, where it's just a handful of weedy species growing out of pavement, or biodiverse urban communities that we and future generations can learn from and enjoy. With that, I'd like to acknowledge that I could have not done this on my own and I'm sincerely grateful for all those that have contributed to the project. Thank you very much. We had an awesome team of undergraduates and graduate students and researchers uh, helping collect data before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, I had all those undergraduates helping me sort all these samples and I had friends coming out and helped me survey some of the ponds. So I'm sincerely grateful for all of you. Um, I specifically want to thank Dr. Dan Preston for allowing me the opportunity to do this research and guiding me throughout the process. And Dr. Aaron Saar, who's a postdoc who started this data collection effort and really helped me uh, get going, as well as my committee, Dr. Monica Turner and Dr. Emily Stanley for their feedback and thoughtful insight to this research. And then my funders, the Uni University of Wisconsin, the LTER, and the Anna Grant Bridge Scholarship. Thank you all very much. And finally, I want to say thank you to my wife, uh, who is willing to not only move all the way out to Wisconsin so I could do the project, but also put up with a bazillion dead insect samples in her house and listening to me talk about ponds for two years and provide some really thoughtful feedback, as well as my mom and dad, June and Rich William, who, like Dan said, came out to me with me into some of these pond sites and was willing to uh, go into knee deep booth tucking mud to help me sane some ponds. And um, not only did they do that, but throughout my childhood kind of uh, encouraged me and my interest in the natural world. And without that support, I don't know if I'd be here today. And so with that, I'll open it up to questions and discussion. Thank you. Hey, Dan, can you hear me okay? Yep. Uh, this is Brom. I was just one, I just wanted to say I also very impressed with the presentation. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very slick and nice and it's fun to see. Uh, for me, at least, it seems like it was yesterday you were working for me. And uh, so it's fun to see you all grown up and a professional and a scientist, but I hope I haven't embarrassed you. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, um, so that's really cool. It's awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but one question I had, and, and uh, maybe this is nitpicking again, I was curious about, I was a little surprised, I guess, but, but that's how science is sometimes about the, uh, the, um, the aquatic vegetation factor. Like, could you speak a little more about that or what your thoughts are as to why you didn't see a difference? And, and do you think it's maybe a sampling issue or, or what's going on there? Um, yeah, so with the aquatic vegetation, I think that it did follow the same pattern of um, 
there was a little bit more variety of uh, species in the uh, rural habitats. Like that's where you got those stoneworts and some of these more rare plant taxa. Right. But in general, there was, you know, you get a lot of the same like duckweeds and um, typha and phalaris. Phalaris was at every single site or the uh -huh. canary grass. And so in general, the plant community actually didn't vary that much. And so, yeah, I'd say that was somewhat surprising. Um, but again, um, you know, it's just kind of how the data turned out. And I think that using that pond survey protocol, um, it actually provided a kind of more holistic view of the ponds rather than just doing like a transect survey and then extrapolating some plots, you know? Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank awesome. You Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You can throw questions in the chat or you can unmute and ask questions if you have them. Hey, Daniel, awesome job. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you Tara. I was kind of curious just because I'm just a nerd about turtles. Um, mm -hmm. So you said you found three turtles. I was just curious how that relates to Wisconsin's total turtle richness. Like, were there other species you expected to find that weren't there? Or is that yeah. good? Yeah. So um, the three turtle species we found, and I'm also a turtle enthusiast, uh, is that we found painted turtles, snapping turtles, and those blanding turtles. And so blanding turtles are species of concern in Wisconsin and they're becoming more rare. And um, before starting my project at the Wildlife Society conference, there were some presentations about blanding turtles and the concerns with them. And that's what kind of prompted that um, camera trap studies because they thought that in urban environments, blanding turtles were less likely to be found there because of nest predation and juvenile predation and that urban environments would have more things like raccoons. Mm -hmm. But as far as other species, um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head how many species Wisconsin has in total, but I think it's probably like 12 to 15 species. But a lot of those are maybe like map turtles and others like wood turtles that are more associated with river habitats. The, there are two species that I would have maybe um, thought we would, might have found, and that was um, soft shell turtles and like mud turtles, um, which we did not find. And I think if we would have done more specific turtle focused trapping, maybe we'd have found some of those things like mud turtles, but given just uh, the survey methods we had, those are the species we found. And the painted turtles seem to be pretty ubiquitous throughout the urban environment. Um, snapping turtles a little bit more rare and tended to key in on sites that had those fish because they're mm. fish predators. And then those blanding turtles, it's interesting the sites, there's only a handful that had blanding turtles. And what I noticed, uh, they tended to prefer some of these sites that had a super deep flocculent layer and like very deep mud. And so that makes me think that they kind of cue in on these sites and use maybe that mud, uh, deep mud as like a overwintering habitat, so. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, thank you. Are there further questions? Are there any questions in the chat, Austin? There are no questions in the chat yet, no. Okay. All right, no other questions. I can just talk about ponds and frogs and turtles all day if you guys want to keep hearing me talk. <laughs> Hey, um, hey, Dan, this is Amy. Hi, Amy. Hey, I, I'll ask a question, which is sort of um, motivated by a conversation that you and I had on maybe your, your first or second day of work uh, with us here uh -huh. at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So great presentation. I'm really excited to have you on our team. And it was really fun to learn uh, more about what you were doing dur during your graduate work. And also, uh, just like really beautiful presentation, like nicely put together. And I love all of those images. I know most of which you took, so pretty impressive. But mm -hmm. uh, my question has to do with the water quality piece. And I think you mentioned that, um, I know there were several water quality metrics that you evaluated as a part of this research. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on uh, what, I, uh, what I think I recall as being kind of a, a lack of correlation between some of the response metrics that you were looking at and water quality. And if you have any thoughts on that, thanks. 
Sure. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I appreciate your comments and your question. Uh, so yeah, as far as um, water chemistry, so I used a YSI meter to take these water chemistry variables. In addition to doing chloride and um, pH, we also did water temperature, dissolved oxygen, and um, nitrates, and conductivity. And um, I was actually extremely surprised to see that there wasn't as much variation uh, in those metrics as I thought there would be. Um, and when you, when I could have showed all these box plots of these different variables, but they're, they're not statistically different from each other. And I think that might be due to the fact that these water measurements were only taking once at early summer, once at late summer, and then once again, the next year. And then I took the average, you know, say the pH of the average of those four measurements. So you're getting kind of an average, but the other thing is that like for pH example, uh, Wisconsin has extremely hard water. And so usually when you get really hard water, it doesn't fluctuate in pH as much. And then like the, for like the chloride, I was really surprised by that. I thought for sure there'd be way higher chloride concentrations in these stormwater ponds in the urban environment. But I talked to another graduate student, uh, Linnea Rock, who did her master's on chloride in the urban environment. And she said that maybe why I'm not seeing such drastic differences was the fact that um, the road salts are tend to be applied in the winter and that our sampling regime was more in the summer and that by the time that we sampled, a lot of those chloride might've been flushed out because a lot of these uh, stormwater ponds have pretty high flushing rates. And so um, I think that might have been kind of some of those kind of why we didn't see as much variation as I thought we would. And I also think that something that was interesting while I was out in the field is I saw that a lot of these stormwater ponds, when you have a storm event, their water levels can just vary really drastically, which like in some of my camera trap images, you know, the camera trap was maybe three feet above the water and at a distance. And then overnight, the water would have fully sunk the camera trap and rose three feet in less than 24 hours. And so unfortunately with my YSI sampling, I didn't capture that variability, but I think that um, the organisms living in the stormwater ponds have to be adaptable to that variation. And I think if you were to have something like loggers in those ponds, you would have seen that there is pretty big fluctuations in uh, the water chemistry. But unfortunately, just from our uh, YSIs, we weren't able to capture that. So that's why I was suggesting um, more thorough water quality sampling um, and adding things like phosphorus and heavy metals would be really interesting to compare that with these biodiversity metrics. So thank you. Thank you very much for your question, Amy. It looks like there's a couple questions in the chat. Um, first one is you spoke about pond management. Could you offer other suggestions uh, about management to human actions on the surrounding landscape? Yeah, and so kind of, as I mentioned, I think that when you, especially when you reduce the this like uh, buffer of like cattails and emergent vegetation and you like mow right up to the water's edge, you really see a decline in diversity there where if there's no emergent habitat and it just drops into like a deeper pond, um, things like geese tend to like that mowed grass and surrounding a pond, but pretty much all them, like especially macroinvertebrates, amphibians and stuff, they avoided ponds like that. Um, so I think just, just a simple management of just like retaining at least some buffer would be beneficial. Um, and then, the, so because so many different entities manage these different ponds, I wasn't able to like track down specifically what management was going on when. And so I thought that would be a really interesting uh, component that someone could, um, you know, dig into, or maybe another student could uh, evaluate, you know, this biodiversity data with these different management strategies. And I think in turn, that's really beneficial to managers um, to kind of see an overall, like different agencies might be managing in one way than another and seeing which ones were leading to more species rich ponds or, retention of some of these target species that are kind of rare in the urban environment. But yeah, thank you. Is there another question in the chat? Yeah, there is. Uh, so the other question is, how do you think this work translates to other urban areas, uh, maybe outside of the Midwest or larger population centers than Madison? Um, sure, yeah, I think this could be, I think in general, the uh, conclusions I have about like, having great, you need greater habitat complexity in these riparian buffers um, and then incorporating ponds into green spaces. I think those will be beneficial to uh, ponds or wetlands across urban environments uh, nationwide and even bigger env environments. 
And I think um, also trying to prevent species introduction, I think is huge. Um, and I think it's definitely worthwhile to maybe go beyond just informing anglers and boaters about the risk of invasive species, but other folks, especially releasing pets into the urban environment. Um, but yeah, so I think this could be applied uh, beyond this. And I think as we know that urban env environments are gonna continue to grow, the more we can kind of preserve some of the natural habitat into these green spaces, A, you know, it preserves biodiversity, but B, like people enjoy having this kind of access to a green space. And I've seen that, I mean, I grew up in Phoenix originally, but when you have like, you know, South Mountain or some of these like desert habitats, people really enjoy having that opportunity to walk in some natural habitat. Um, and that at least allows some space for this uh, native biodiversity to remain in the area. So, yeah, thank you. Is there other questions? There's nothing left in the chat. Nothing left in the chat? No. Okay. I think maybe with that we can uh, we can thank Daniel digitally over our uh, over our screens and and Daniel really nicely done. That was a lot of fun to to hear about. So we can go and uh, now interrogate you some more in your defense. So nicely done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you all for coming. It's great to see uh, some new faces and some familiar faces come and hear about my research. I really appreciate all you showing up. And uh, with that, I will take it, uh, end this meeting and talk to my committee. Thank you all. <laughs>